Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think you can start. Uh, uh yeah. A very good afternoon to all of you. I warmly welcome you all to the webinar, Minilateralism in the Indo-Pacific, Opportunities and Challenges, organized by the Indo-Pacific Circle in collaboration with the Center for Public Policy Research. The Indo-Pacific Circle is a curated network of early and mid-career scholars from the uh, region and uh, who, who are engaged in shaping emerging narratives of the Indo-Pacific. Center for Public Policy Research is an independent public policy organization dedicated to in-depth research and scientific analysis in the areas of international relations and security, among others. Uh, and today we are honored to present a distinguished panel of experts for this discussion. Our session today will be chaired by Dr. Shreya Upadhyay. Uh, Dr. Upadhyay is the Deputy Director of Kalinga Institute of, Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies. She has formerly worked as an assistant professor at Price University, and her research focuses on issues of, of food and water security, climate change-induced human displacement, and Indo-Pacific affairs. Uh, we have three expert speakers, Dr. Jagannath Panda, who's the head of Stockholm Center for South Asian and Indo-Pacific Affairs, and a professor at the Department of Regional and Global Studies at the University of Warsaw. He's a senior expert on China, East Asia, and Indo-Pacific affairs. His research focuses on India's relations with major Indo-Pacific powers. Dr. Pramesha Saha is a fellow with ORF Strategic Studies Program. She's also a visiting research fellow, Japan Forum of, on International Affairs, oh, sorry, International Relations, and has been awarded the Japan Foundation Indo-Pacific Partnership Fellowship. Her research focuses on emerging dynamics of the Indo-Pacific region. Professor Ki Koga is Associate Professor at the Public Policy and Global Affairs Program, School of Social Sciences, Nanyang Technological University. Concurrently, he's a non-resident fellow at the National Bureau of Asia Research. His research focuses on international security, regional institutions, particularly the ASEAN and Indo-Pacific security, with that, I will now hand over the floor to Dr. Upadhyay and request her to take over the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, um, Amba. It's uh, great to be here. And I think the topic that we're going to discuss today is very timely. Uh, we're looking at minilateralism in the Indo-Pacific um, opportunities and challenges. And um, if we see in the post-Cold uh, War period, it was either the United States-centered uh, bilateralism or ASEAN-led multilateralism uh, that dominated the regional security architecture in the region, in Indo-Pacific. And uh, this eventually led to increasing doubts regarding the effectiveness with countries, um, and, and you know, which led to countries then turning uh, into alternative forms of cooperation, such as the minilateral uh, arrangements. Now, uh, compared to multilateral uh, groupings, it is the minilateral platforms are smaller in size, they are more exclusive, they are more uh, flexible, um, functional, and largely issue-based. Now, the last few years, uh, we've all seen uh, sprouting of minilaterals uh, in Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, some of the examples include Quad, AUKUS, and most recently, SQUAD. Um, in the changing global order and uh, the growing hostilities between major powers, minilateralism thus has emerged as an alternative, as a viable alternative for several countries. And of late, uh, minilateral initiatives have turned, earned this title of being uh, the building blocks of uh, Indo-Pacific regional architecture. For many um, of the recent uh, minilaterals, China, whether implicitly or explicitly, uh, is a shared concern. Uh, participants of many minilaterals are perceived as being willing and like-minded in responding to China's rise and a very assertive foreign policy behavior. The newer minilateral uh, groupings are either elements of the US-led free and open Indo-Pacific Indo strategy or efforts by middle powers to kind of diversify and strengthen relations as uh, they tackle challenges vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, major powers. Now, given current regional dynamics, it is likely that minilateral groupings will continue to emerge and convene. The operational focus of any minilateral group is grounded ultimately on the geographies of their collective interest. 
And in the vast Indo-Pacific, minilaterals therefore make very obvious sense because uh, several countries are likely to have varied focuses on uh, specific subregions, and these groups therefore require a specific focus with less number of players involved. Additionally, minilateralism also has emerged as an important medium of bolstering cooperation for small and developing countries, who often are mindful of not positioning themselves at the crossroad of great power uh, contests. Now, but whether these arrangements would last in the longer term remains a point of debate. Um, another factor that needs to be explored is whether the creation of this patchwork quilt of minilaterals in the region Will that not lead to a disjointed approach towards policy and strategy um, in a you know in a common uh, geographic region? As they say, too many uh, cooks spoil the broth. Can too many frameworks lead to fragmentation of action and dilute outcomes? It is these questions that today uh, we would like to explore in the webinar. I request the speakers to now begin with their opening remarks, keep the focus on how the rising trend of minilateral groupings are reshaping the international system. The speakers can then delve into uh, on the timing and the, ge uh, the geopolitical necessities of their emergence in the Indo-Pacific. What are the factors, what are the motivations behind the formations of these groupings? Uh, please, uh, I request each speaker to uh, keep the time uh, to five to seven minutes for their opening uh, remarks. And uh, first and foremost, I invite Dr. Jagannath Panda to uh, uh, you know, begin your thoughts. Thank you, Sreya. Um, great pleasure to be here. And uh, let me thank uh, uh, CSDR and uh, CPPR uh, for this kind invitation. And uh, you know, happy to meet um, uh, old friends here. And I think uh, almost um, I, I, I happen to know uh, almost uh, majority of the attendance today. So that's a good thing. So we could keep it interactive. Um, and I think, uh, Shreya, just to start with you, what you um, you know shared with us is very interesting. And I think, uh, 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 let me at the outset share this information with all of you that uh, we are coming, a group of experts, we are coming uh, with a special issue with the Australian Journal of International Affairs. Uh, end of this year, sometimes in November, December, about a study about minilateralism. That, um, you know, how minilateralism differs from multilateralism and what it intends to achieve. Uh, in fact, um, you know, I was just uh, teaching my course um, uh, last semester in University of Warsaw. Uh, one student, uh, Polish student, where the European politics, despite of the Ukraine war, you know, um, making the European countries and European member states to stay united politically, but still we know that within Europe there are many voices and there are many groupings, there are many categories of approaches to the Indo-Pacific, to the world politics that the European member country, EU member countries hold towards the uh, international politics. One of the students uh, from Poland asked me uh, a very fundamental question that uh, how old is minilateralism uh, in its existence? Is it really a new concept or is it a, a kind of a old concept? My answer, and this is where, you know, one of our special issues, which will be published end of this year uh, with a range of experts from, from different parts of the world is coming out that minilateralism is not necessarily a new concept. It existed during the first world war, second world war. Um, what we call minilateralism is an effect of polarized politics. Um, if we talk about Indo-Pacific itself, uh, Indo-Pacific might be a club of many like-minded or many uh, shared countries having a common interest in the regions. It might club a lot of countries together. But if we try to understand Indo-Pacific in its, its narrow sense, there it, 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 it uh, explains to a polarized politics having quad, having occurs, having different kind of formulations within it. So to answer very, uh, you know, shortly that minilateralism is not necessarily a new concept. It existed within, in, in World War II or World War uh, uh, I, and it is primarily a club of polarized power politics. And therefore we have seen that time also during the World War I and World War II that powers get club with each other and they are, there are divisions. And uh, they are actually a kind of polarized politics, uh, which explains to minilateralism. But what essentially today, 
in the contemporary world politics, what we are seeing that militarism also explains to a power variations and power distribution. And I think this is where we need to um, uh, draw a distinction that uh, what is the distinction between, uh, you know, multipolarism and multipolarity. Multipolarism is a bigger platform that, uh, you know, allows powers to, you know, share interest. Whereas multipolarity is a substructure of multipolarism, which allows the power to be distributed. So when we are talking about minilateralism, minilateralism is very closely and substructurally linked with multipolarity. And this is something which is very interesting because what we have seen that not only the major powers like the US and China, but also other countries are imbibing or welcoming the trends in minilateralism. We have seen that the US is a champion actor when it comes to minilateralism. They have so many minilateralism, trilateral groupings, quadrilateral groupings in world politics. The US is having trilateral groupings with Japan, with India, with, uh, with Australia and Japan, and with many other countries uh, across the world. Um, similarly, you know, Japan um, uh, does the same. Uh, we have seen from the opposite camp when it comes to major countries, uh, China also doing the same. If we go back to the Chinese history, we'll also find that the Chinese actually originally proposed the Shanghai Five in late late nineties. Uh, um, of course, there are you know instances in history the Chinese have gone for minilateral groupings, but the formal minilateral groupings was in the form of Shanghai Five, and then it eventually uh, you know established as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in two thousand one. Today, we are seeing a trend that this is not necessarily limited to US and China or US and Japan. This is also becoming a trend for many other competent actors, particularly those competent actors who wants to you know, position them, themselves as an exclusive actor in the regions, having their own identity. They could be clubbed as middle powers, they could be clubbed as rising powers, they could be said as powers of the future. For example, India. For example, countries, some of the Southeast Asian countries, they are becoming the hub of uh, world politics and the trend they are imbibing in their politics is military politics. And as a result, today we see that India is associated with so many military groupings in, in, in Indo-Pacific regions. So three points I will make before I leave it to other um, you know, panelists to comment. One is that when we are talking about militarism, is it is an effect of polarized politics. And therefore, polarization is a new normal of world politics today and primarily in Indo-Pacific itself. Second is that within minilateralism, what we are doing is actually, we are um, trying to connect with two bigger picture. One is we are on the one hand, we are trying to take a side about um, uh, multipolarism, uh, where we are talking about, you know, uh, preserving the rules based order, we are trying to talk about, you know, like-mindedness. We are talking about shared interest. Uh, so we are talking about the bigger platform, which is about multipolarism. When it comes to minilateralism, we are also equally talking about multipolarity. For example, if I could give a couple of examples, we are talking about Quad. We are talking about I2, U2. We are talking about, you know, uh, Squad, which has been, um, you know, uh, come up recently with the formation of Singapore. Um, this talks about the distribution of responsibility and res distribution of power. And these are interesting because this is where we are seeing that countries are thinking beyond the US-China narrative. Countries are trying to think by themselves, trying to identify their interest and trying to share the interest with the middle-ranked rising um, uh, powers in the regions. And this is what India is doing with many other countries in the regions. This is where many of the Southeast Asian countries are also trying to find their ways. Also many other countries, including Japan and Australia, they are trying beyond the US narrative. They are trying beyond the US-China rivalry narrative. And that is something needs to be welcomed. The two other aspects are that what we are interestingly seeing, even though the definitional aspect of middle power is still vague, and I think, uh, uh, my good friend Kay has written about this, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know whether he will agree with me or not. I think the definitional aspect of uh, middle power is still not very much uh, is there in the academic domain. I mean, 
uh, there are it is there in the open platform uh, it is subject to interpretation but there is a general acknowledgement that there is a lot of um, uh, countries in the indo pacific are there who who could be clubbed as middle powers even though we don't really necessarily have a definitional agreement on what really constitute or what really defines middle powers so middle powers for example countries like india japan south korea uh, 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 australia indonesia singapore they are actually becoming the hub of uh, minority politics including some of the countries from middle east and uh, so therefore what we are seeing that for the first time uh, there is a club of countries middle power countries they are also taking a lead when it comes to minority politics and that is a new turf in indo in 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 indo pacific regions the last point is i think something interesting uh, what what would actually worry to the chinese to some extent you know when i uh, started writing about this two decades back when i think uh, uh, commodore uh, paramar would recall about this uh, about our ids association when we when you used to talk about china's emergence as a blue water navy uh, some sometimes two decades back uh, 15 years back let's say um, early years of uh, the former chinese president uh, hu jintao um he talked about how china should be welcomed in the indo pacific regions how china could be a security provider as well as china could be a common goods provider in the indo pacific regions and this is where the chinese were trying to you know pan out their indo pacific uh, indian ocean strategy that time but today when we look at i think there is a huge um setback to the chinese planning in the sense that mm, no matter how much you know stationing point Uh, you know ports uh, and uh, maritime bases they are they have successfully built but on the other hand they are lose out they are losing out their uh, you know their um, their uh, good tack as a as a as a country which could provide goods or as a country who could actually provide economic benefits to the regions because a lot of countries are actually realizing the uh, the 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 drawbacks of accepting the chinese um aid and uh, donations and the financial packages on on its face value and as a result china is losing out its internal image and face uh, china has faced a significant uh, it had a huge um face loss on in europe itself in the uh, in the following uh, uh, the ukraine war and as a result we saw that when the uh, framework of 17 plus 1 has actually been reduced to 13 plus 1 so when it comes to minilateral groupings what actually china used to look lead including the global south including the brics including the seo um even on the one hand the chinese are trying to expand some of these um, organizations like they have gone in terms of supporting in of expansion of seo they have supported the expansion of the brics but those are actually coming under the circumstances and coming as a kind of a um, uh, you know as 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 a shortcomings to the chinese planning because chinese are expanding this multilateral or minilateral forums keeping in view that uh, the chinese are actually losing out a lot of global talks in 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 many regions for example they are expand the brics because they are realizing they have to build a goodwill globally uh, they are expanding shanghai cooperation organization because they are re- realizing that india is emerging as a you know kind of a big actor in the regions so there are many sets are to the chinese expansion um in uh, to the minilateral forums to multilateral forums they had organized so i think uh, minilateralism is posing a lot of challenges to many countries to the major powers uh, in indo pacific regions when countries like india japan are finding new turfs so the americans are is slightly under the back foot that uh, whether they are not really wanted by these countries or uh, or they are wanted so th- there is a dilemma for the americans when it comes to the european regions the chinese are also definitely on a setback given the examples i cited and i think these are the issues that we need to really keep it in mind when we are talking about the future of minilateralism in indo pacific i'll stop here and probably take a few comments uh, in the process thank you great uh, thank you uh, dr panda i think uh, your point about how uh, minilateralisms may not necessarily be a new uh, uh, concept and have been age old but then together today they're showing, showing a polarized uh, 
politics in place and how it, they are kind of a um, on one hand opportunities for the middle powers and the rising powers and the powers of the future uh, to not just uh, take the responsibility and you know uh, to not only take over take over a lot of global responsibilities but also are acting as kind of a challenge to uh, China and even in you know in a certain way uh, the United States that may be losing out their turf to a lot of uh, middle powers. I think with that I uh, request uh, Dr. Premisha if uh, you know uh, keep your opening remarks to about five to seven uh, minutes. Um, thank you, Shreya, and um, thank you for the invitation. So um, I think um, I can actually take a lot of uh, things from uh, what Ms. Uh, Dr. Panda said and um, reflect on that. So um, first, um, remember when um, I was also doing this project on the India-Australia-Indonesia trilateral, and I think that time, this was 2019, and um, the Quad was just re-evolving um, you know, that, during that time. And I think the main um, problem we were facing was how to make um, Indonesians or Southeast Asians realize the importance of such trilateral and minilateral groupings, uh, which were emerging in the Indo-Pacific. Um, not as, as pointed out before, it's not a new phenomenon, but the way it was emerging and the situations which motivated uh, these minilaterals to emerge, I think that was what the main issue was that time. And um, I think um, during that research, what we realized is, uh, is the same thing, actually, um, that minilateral groupings and countries coming together for a specific purpose or to address a specific issue is actually not a new thing. Um, if you are even looking at, for example, Southeast Asia, uh, the Malacca Street, uh, you know, the Malacca Sea Patrol, the Eye in the Sky initiated, the Sulu Sea Patrol, these initiatives are also, in a way, just involving countries who have specific interests and specific issues. So these were also bringing together countries in need, countries who were intending to address a certain issue. So um, we sort of saw that, you know, in the, if we are presenting in these terms that how these groupings are issue based, how these are just me meant to for countries who have shared interests and shared purpose to come together, these kind of examples already exist to fall back on, to sort of make the case for uh, minilateralism in the Indo-Pacific. The second issue, um, you know, which was there, um, it is still there, but I think it's fairly getting adjusted is um, how with the emergence of these kind of minilaterals are multilateral groups which already exist in the region, how they are getting impacted, especially ASEAN and ASEAN-led mechanisms. So I think one of the primary uh, debates which took place after the uh, after Quad 2.0 was, is the ASEAN centrality getting compromised or is there, or is the faith in ASEAN demeaning? Um, but I think the recent survey, um, which the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies undertook, uh, which they take every year annually, uh, the state of Southeast Asia, there I think we saw that um, not in totality, but at least there is some cozying up to the Quad. I think um, there is this realization that um, Quad is not a hard security grouping. What I mean is it's not a grouping which looks at traditional security issues. So I think in some ways, there is this little bit of accepting the Quad, which is uh, taking place uh, within this region and the realization that what the Quad intends to do is very different from what multilateral organizations are meant to do. Um, another thing I think um, which is worth mentioning uh, when we are talking about these uh, you know, groupings like, uh, for example, the East Asia Summit, which according to the Southeast Asian nations, the, the East Asia Summit already exists, which has mostly all the Indo-Pacific countries uh, as members or as a part of it, then why do we, why is there a need for such minilateral groupings? The countries are already coming together in these groupings to discuss on issues. Why do we need se separate uh, groupings like this? Um, but I think one thing which I actually got from discussing with a view um, of uh, experts from Vietnam was that the East Asia Summit, these groupings are actually just hosting leaders of states, and it's just a meeting platform. There is not much bandwidth to discuss sensitive issues on these platforms. So I think even in that scenario, minilaterals are important. Um, there have been organizations, for example, uh, let's take uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, for example, 27 Indian Ocean Little Countries in one platform. 
everybody probably has one shared interest of securing the Indian Ocean, but I think national interests of countries have, um, you know, how countries, are, are, what kind of threats each country faces, again, very different. So I think these differing perceptions or differing threat perceptions of security uh, notions sometimes cause hurdles in the working of these groupings. This is where I think the advantage of minilaterals also lie. It's limited number of countries coming together for a specific purpose. That purpose can be of dealing with a growing Chinese challenge. That purpose can be to, you know, even just making your voices heard or, or a collective goal of ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific, for example. So um, there are at least these specific um, interests of a limited number of countries coming together. So maybe functioning is more smooth. But one aspect also, I think, which is important for will multilateral, will minilateralism, uh, you know, continue in the future. If we take the example of a country like, say, India, um, India is a part of many minilateral formats. And I think there have been discussions, is India giving up its non-alignment stand or what is the motive of India being a part of so many minilaterals? And I think the response we give is that we are looking for issue-based uh, partnerships. We're looking for issue-based uh, uh, partnerships in this region. And it's not giving up our non-alignment stand because India is still not a treaty ally of any country. But I think even after being a part of minilaterals, which are essentially, for, for example, even US-led or US-driven, uh, we see middle powers or countries still keeping their national interests or keeping their strategic autonomy intact. I think that is also important to note how even through these minilaterals, middle powers are also act actually getting their voice heard or the, you know, the realization that middle powers are all rising powers are also important when we are talking about the Indo-Pacific because this is a, a huge geography and it's a mix of countries. Not every country is extremely developed or there are middle powers in this country, uh, in, the, in this region as, as well. Um, and I think India is a great example in that we saw how even after being a part of the Quad, its stand was different in terms of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And, um, you know, uh, some even uh, argue that uh, the coming of groupings like the Squad or AUKUS, is it because India is shying away from letting traditional security issues get discussed on platforms like the Quad, for example. Um, so these kind, uh, you know, so this also goes on to show that middle powers are also still keeping their national interests or keeping their own strategic autonomy intact. I think that also gives a good message to multilateral organ organizations that these groupings are not essentially being led by one country and asking you to choose a side, um, you know, because these are examples that you're actually not choosing sides in between the two great power competition. And as um, Dr. Panda said, it's moving beyond the US-China great power competition to keep your own global uh, image intact. So I think these are important issues to look into. And um, but one debate I think which would be interesting to discuss is actually, though on the one hand, we are saying that, you know, India is a part of so many minilateral groupings, but on the other hand, we even see a lot of uh, other countries pointing out if India is an outlier in groups like the Quad, for example, and is it India's hesitation of not discussing or not making the Quad uh, look at traditional security issues? For example, the issue, uh, for example, the um, encroachments in the South China Sea uh, getting discussed, is that what is motivating the formation of groupings like, for example, the squad. Um, so these are, I think, important uh, issues to also discuss and uh, talks about the future of the Quad, whether it's just meant to look at non-traditional security issues, even after having, say, a Malabar naval exercise, which was being said as a Quad naval exercise. But um, though, uh, you know, there are many other ways of looking at it. But um, these discussions, I think, goes on to show how these minilateral groupings are also evolving with time. It might have started off as you know, addressing the China challenge, but now how these are evolving to uh, look much beyond that, look at the Indo-Pacific, because I think the one thing that Indo-Pacific does is provides a lot of opportunities for cooperation. And um, I think that is important um, to look into. So I um, think I, I kept to the five minute mark and I'll be open to taking the questions and comments and contributing to the concrete, uh, you know, discussion. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Pramisha. I think your uh, point is very well taken that uh, uh, minilaterals would, may, you know, in Indo -Pacific, Pacific would have started with maybe looking at China or trying to constrain China in a certain way, but <clears throat> have actually uh, been evolving with time. And they're looking at larger Indo Pacific uh, issues where countries are coming together and middle powers are coming together to discuss more, uh, you know, more sensitive issues that would not find a place in more, you know, in multilateral uh, groupings. And, um, and 
while doing that they are also able to keep their strategic autonomy intact so i think these are you know few of the uh, key takeaways from uh, uh, you know your uh, points uh, now i request uh, dr uh, uh, professor kuga please uh, uh, yeah your opening remarks Okay. Um. Thank you very much. Uh. Thank you. Uh. For the uh, inviting to uh this uh the uh webinar. I actually so the uh, last speaker is kind of like the how to explain like what we actually what I wanted to talk about because the uh, most of the things are actually already mentioned, uh in the previous scholars. But then the uh, I actually so want to make it like really short and then the, I probably like the uh, basically agree with the uh, what the uh, Jagannath and then Premarsha uh said. Uh, that the uh, those are the uh, there are many uh, minerals already, and then the uh, minerals are not necessarily new. Uh, the uh, there was the uh, some kind of histories about the uh, uh, emergence of minerals, and then the uh, also the uh, uh, we are actually kind of seeing uh, the new minerals uh, because the uh, there is some kind of like the uh, uh, the deficiencies or like the uh, uh, this function uh, this functionality. Of the uh, existing uh, the regional security framework, which is based on the uh, hub and spoke system uh, led by the United States and also ASEAN led the uh, uh, regional institutions. So I uh, basically agree with that. And then, um, but I actually want to uh, emphasize there are different types of the multilateralism. Uh, and then the uh, uh, what I actually want to uh, the uh, say here is that there are basically two kinds of multilateralism. On the one hand, the uh, strategic militarism, and then the other one is the uh, functional realism. Uh, let me explain from the uh, functional reali uh, the uh, militarism side. Uh, the functional reali uh, militarism are all, always there. So if we take a look at the uh, the uh, core group uh, created in the 2004, uh, Japan, uh, the United States, Australia, uh, India actually cooperated with the, uh, each other in order to uh, engage the uh, humanitarian assistance and the disaster relief, HADR, uh, for the uh, Indian Ocean uh, tsunami. And then the, uh, that was the uh, kind of functional ad hoc, the uh, uh, region, uh, the militarism. And then on the basis of that, they started to kind of think about the uh, institutionalizations and also expansion of the functionality of that, these groupings. And then as the, uh, <clears throat> I think Premisha uh, mentioned, uh, and also the uh, Jagannath also mentioned, the, uh, there's the uh, militarism uh, in the Southeast Asia as well. Uh, Malaysia, uh, the uh, Singapore, and also the uh, Indonesia, uh, the uh, joint kind of patrol, uh, eyes in the sky. Uh, those are the uh, things that the uh, ASEAN countries and uh, engaged with the uh, militarism. It's more kind of functional, and then it's actually uh, the uh, have the specific purpose issue based one, right? The uh, uh, including the counter terrorism, counter piracy, uh, and then uh, if we take a uh, think about the uh, trilateral cooperation between Japan, Australia, and then the uh, uh, United States. Uh, which was created in the 2006 or seven, uh, they were also uh, uh, geared toward the uh, um, dealing with the uh, uh, those kind of functional uh, the issues, non uh, the traditional security issues such as the uh, uh, the international terrorism. So I, I think the uh, there those are the uh, the things that like functional uh, the uh, the militarism is always there, and then it is actually easy to uh, the uh, Institute because the uh, the purpose is for the uh, non traditional security issues and then they don't actually uh, openly have the uh, any kind of strategic the uh, uh, the objectives, but the reason why like, we are actually talking about the militarism recently more and more actively is because there is also another kind of like new militarism emerging that is the uh, strategic militarism, and then the uh, when we talk about the uh, Quad and uh, Orcas. Uh, then yes, they are actually talking about some of the functional issues, but then the, uh, it's more kind of multifunctional, and then they were actually geared toward the uh, more the uh, strategic purpose. That is the uh, to maintain the uh, balance of power uh, based on the uh, uh, the uh, rules-based uh, international order, uh, and then the uh, the disruption was caused by the uh, those kind of emerging powers, particularly the China, right? And then uh, for uh, in order to maintain the uh, balance of power in favor of those kind of like the big powers, uh, they wanted to create certain kind of like the military platform uh, to talk about the what kind of the cooperation they could engage and what kind of the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, military or like the defense issues they could actually talk about. But then because the uh, the commitment 
it's not that like really strong, and we are not really sure uh, to what extent the uh, each country can commit militarily and also the politically and diplomatically. They actually started off by the uh, creating the dialogue, and then so the uh, it's actually started off from the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, like software framework, and then the uh, when they uh, uh, their interest converges, they actually push forward to the uh, institutionalize. Institutionalize, uh, not meaning formalize. Uh, the uh, I, I'm not talking about the uh, creating the uh, secretariat or anything, but then the, I'm talking about the uh, creating the uh, certain kind of the uh, regular uh, meetings at the uh, uh, the uh, official working level, official level. Uh, the uh, also the uh, ministry level or summit level. So these are the uh, uh, some kind of the uh, strategic multilateralism that like we have been seeing. But then the uh, uh, the those kind of functional multilateralism and then the strategic multilateralism are there. And then the one kind of uh, the uh, really interesting thing is that they are actually changing over time. So some of this strategic multilateralism can be actually transferring to the uh, functional multilateralism. And then functional militarism can be uh, also like the uh, changing to the uh, strategic militarism, depending on the situation we are actually facing. So uh, that's the uh, the uh, I think the uh, the demarcation I create. And then the uh, I, I think like for now the quad is the uh, somewhat in between the functional militarism and the strategic militarism, while the uh, Ocas is the uh, uh, based on the more kind of strategic uh, militarism. And then some of the other uh, uh, militarism are uh, based on the uh, middle powers are uh, actually mostly the uh, functional militarism. But then as the uh, uh, previous the uh, uh, the uh, speakers already said, uh, they are uh, actually kind of trying to secure their strategic autonomy also. So they have the certain kind of strategic the uh, uh, objective and they could actually transfer the uh, different types of the uh, strategic militarism too. So these are the kind of demarcation I made. And then the, uh, I'll stop here and then I will look for the uh, discussion. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor, for uh, in fact kind of culling out the theoretical aspects of uh, uh, multilateralism. I think now uh, we will start to quickly uh, move with some of the questions, the leading uh, questions. Uh, my first question is to uh, Dr. Panda. Uh, how do you think uh, the minilateral partnerships are reshaping regional institutional architecture in the region? That's an interesting question. In fact, um, it was a part of a discussion um, a few few weeks back in Stockholm. Uh, if you see, it does not mean that uh, all the established multilateral institutions have gone to a deeper crisis. No. Uh, in fact, if you see, uh, there is a lot of uh, criticism about UN uh, after the Ukraine war, after the uh, you know uh, after the Middle Eastern crisis. Uh, there was a lot of criticism about WHO um, after the pandemic. Come to think about this, that we are only picking up the example saying that these established multilateral forums or venues have not really succeeded in stopping the war. But we are not really taking into consideration to analyze that how many wars or how many scales of conflicts have been dealt with this multilateral forums earlier, or they are being uh, denied to rise to a different level of conflict. And I think to that context, we need organizations and bigger platforms. Uh, we need multilateral institutions, and there is a relevance for institutions like UN, WHO, and all. But I think um, uh, Professor Kei Kuga pointed out a very interesting analysis uh, when he said, functional um, minilateralism. That explains that not all the multilateral forums or multi uh, minilateral uh, forums could be clubbed under the same, um, uh, same, same formulations. So we need to distinguish. So answering your questions that whether the minilateral groupings has put the established multilateral groupings into defensive, not in its, my answer is not in its entirety. We need bigger multilateral forums, bigger multilateral institutions, um, because they they are the need of the time to address the bigger global uh, governance issues. For example, we need a grand forums uh, which could actually talk 
talk about transnational research or trans regional research um for example a, a institution like iora um is the most important one at this point of time when there is so much discussion about maritime security when so much discussion about indo pacific security and i think we need not only iora but we need much more institutions or forums or organizations like iora so in order to answer your questions um, minilateralisms are always welcome because this actually explains the national interest of of individual countries who are actually clubbed in that military frameworks but that does not necessarily make the established um, or bigger platforms um, as irrelevant groupings thank you uh, dr panda i think uh, uh, very well explained my next question is uh, to dr saha uh, so pramisha uh, looking at the quadrilateral uh, security dialogue how do you think minilaterals are coping with and cooperating with other minilaterals or larger multilateral organizations like the asean and you know even when you were talking about in your opening remarks you uh, did point out how uh, you know it could be you know it's it was um, uh, you, you know people were talking about whether the faith in asean uh, uh, was now coming to you know uh, kind of you know was was coming to an end or um, uh, you know uh, people were looking uh, coming up of many laterals as like an end to uh, uh, multilateral organizations or bigger multilateral organizations so in that regard just you know if you can talk about how is it that these guys are cooperating how many laterals are cooperating with other multilateral uh, groupings uh that's a good question um so um in terms of um how many laterals are you know coexisting with other multilateral organizations i think um I agree with uh, Dr. Panda. It has to be seen um, through very critical lens. Uh, for example, um, though bilateral groups are bringing together countries, but I think they are discussing things which are of their own interest. When we are talking about bigger multilateral organizations, for example, the ASEAN, it is very important for an ASEAN to exist to discuss issues which are very, you know, which are inclusive or which are exclusive to the Southeast Asian region. I think that um, for existing, uh, for discussing regional issues, discussing issues which impact the region. Uh, for example, if we are talking about the South China Sea, for example, uh, how this also figures in minilateral uh, discussions, because it has become a global issue. But today, if an issue arises which impacts, say, uh, I know in a globalized world, this is a difficult thing to say, but uh, for example, if an issue arises which impacts specifically the Southeast Asian nations, and that's a sensitive issue, it will be, you need multilateral organizations, you need a body like ASEAN, you need an ASEAN-led mechanism. And for and another thing which needs to be remember, understood is here that ASEAN in general is very important to Southeast Asian nations themselves. I think no matter how um, countries like say Indonesia champion the Indo-Pacific concept a lot, um, even if the ASEAN has come up with an ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, but still ASEAN will always form the main nucleus of the foreign policy. That needs to be understood. And I think it's difficult for these countries to move beyond the ASEAN. So um, even for minilateral groupings, I think this is important to understand. We are minilateral uh, groupings, I think, uh, India, US, Japan, Australia also understand that. Not only these four countries, but other countries who are coming up with their own Indo-Pacific concept also understand that. That's why I think ASEAN centrality is something which is common in all the Indo-Pacific strategies or policies which are uh, initiated. So I think um, because the uh, because Southeast Asia is such a geography, it is center. It is central to the Indo-Pacific geography. I think uh, countries like, for example, Indonesia is sitting right, uh, uh, you know, um, between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So talking with these countries is important. And for engaging with these countries, understanding the relevance of ASEAN is, again, very important. So um, that's why I think there is this realization that multilateral organizations have their own importance. Uh, because um, as uh, um, I think Dr. Panda said, for example, the Indian Ocean region has its own interest. And in a time of maritime security, the minilateral organizations, the Quad, did come up with a maritime domain awareness uh, working group and initiative. But at the same time, I think just four countries talking about maritime security, it is important for mostly all the literal nations, the island nations, which are also facing their own challenges when we are talking about island diplomacy, when we are talking about the Indian Ocean or even Pacific Islands. So I think uh, 
bringing uh, you know the pacific island forum also addressing the issues or the which the pacific island countries are facing so multilateral organizations are important and um, it is important to discuss the bigger issues because uh, many laterals, I think, they take uh, the main reason why they are becoming so very important is because they are a limited number of countries discussing a specific issue. But a multilateral organization, I think, because it discusses a range of issues, uh, it is important. And especially because these organizations feature very particularly or very prominently in the foreign policies of some countries. And I think if we want to engage, for example, with Southeast Asia, we have to keep we have to keep in mind how important the ASEAN is for this region so I think that is why also even in strategic sense um, you know our multilateral organizations a few organizations like ASEAN East Asia Summit uh, ADMM plus these are very important and even for Pacific Island countries I think um, no matter how our countries uh, you know bilateral visits we do I think Pacific Island forum meetings are also very important um, so I think uh, that's these are also very important but i think one advantage which minilateral uh, frameworks have also done they have also made bilateral relationships very strong because this in uh, because this fact about diversifying partnerships is also making countries engage with partners they have not before or have not engaged to that level so i think for example the quad if anything it did i think it also made the bilateral partnerships very strong i think the prime example would be the india australia relationship for example which was uh, which in the last 5 6 years and the last decade has been growing exponentially so i think that is also to the advantage of minilateral platforms so i think both have their own advantages and i think both are important one cannot surpass the other. Very uh, interesting, uh, Pramisha. Uh, now, uh, going to uh, Professor Koga, and in fact, taking uh, from your work itself, um, tell us the challenges and opportunities of strategic minilateralism in the Indo Pacific. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, question. Uh, the uh, just kind of uh, wanted to make it like really kind of quickly about the uh, listing up the uh, opportunities and also the uh, challenges. So the uh, opportunities for the uh, strategic communilateralism is uh, basically the uh, creating a strategic communilateralism is the uh, pretty easy uh, because the uh, it doesn't really require a strong kind of the commitment. You can actually start off by the uh, creating the forum or dialogue ad hoc one. And then they yeah, try to see the uh, what other kind of members are thinking about uh, the strategically. Uh, and then the, uh, if your kind of interest met, then the uh, you could up uh, the uh, uh, institution right. So uh, again, like the uh, nurture the uh, certain kind of a like, cooperative framework. And then the uh, some of the uh, I mean others could be the uh, really useful. Uh, when we think about the uh, I mean the Philippines right now, like the people talk about the uh, squad. But then the uh the Japan and the Philippines uh sorry Japan and the United States are willing to help out uh the uh and for uh the uh uh create uh providing the uh those kind of like the uh the uh defense kind of equipment and also the uh some kind of important equipment to uh maintain uh the Philippines or buttress the uh um Philippines kind of deterrence capabilities against the uh uh the uh China particularly. So in that sense, the uh, those kind of like strategic militarism can be like really really useful that's the kind of opportunities and then the, if you make it right then probably you could maintain the uh, stability in the region even though there might be some kind of tension uh, the challenges on the other hand it's a kind of like flip side of the those flexibility uh there's a particular kind of credibility deficit uh because the uh, if you keep kind of like the uh, creating those a uh, number of militarism and also uh if you are keeping uh the uh, shifting its strategic focus from one military, military framework to another then like it will lose the uh, uh the uh, kind of like the focus and then the diplomatic creativity uh, and then also the uh, another one is the uh, defection risk because the uh, minilateralism doesn't really require the uh, commitment everybody every day uh, the state can actually defect from the other uh, kind of framework easily and then if it's not like legally binding when a uh, push comes to the shop they could just kind of defect so i mean you can actually completely rely on the uh, those kind of strategic framework uh third one is a consistency program and that is actually relating to the uh, uh what the uh Jaganas and premesha uh, so talks about the uh, international relay uh the organizations and the ASEAN. If you create too many minilateral frameworks, you are actually complicates a lot of, I mean, the complicates the regional security architecture. I mean, you don't know what kind of like the uh, uh, the institution is the uh, doing what. 
uh, the uh, in the post Cold War era, there was a certain kind of a division of labor institutionally uh, for, between the uh, U.S. hub and spoke system and also ASEAN led framework. The ASEAN led framework tried to kind of nurture the uh, confidence building, uh, the confidence. Uh, confidence among the uh, member states. On the other hand, then the U.S. have and spoke to make sure uh, the uh, strategic stability in the uh, region. But now, like the uh, those are kind of really uh, the multilateral complicates the, uh, the those kind of functionality. And unless like the, the multilateral new multilateral are communicating with the uh, existing frameworks, particularly the ASEAN, then probably like there's gonna be uh, many kind of pushback coming from the ASEAN member states, and it could actually drive the wedge uh, between the ASEAN uh, the uh, as well. So in that sense, those are kind of risks that the uh, we are facing in creating the military frameworks. Yeah, very interesting, uh, uh, Professor Koga. Now I request uh, all the speakers to uh, kind of give their clue closing uh, remarks. And I would start with uh, Dr. Panda and then go to Pramisha and then to Professor uh, Koga. Um, it's, I think, in terms of closing remarks, uh, we need to look at the future of multilaterals, whether they are uh, likely to, how likely they are to continue, and how will ultimately multilateralism shape up in the light of you know, all the conflicts and all the geopolitical uh, issues that we are facing today in terms of wars, changing international order, even climate change uh, in that sense. Uh, yeah. So I would uh, request first Dr. Panda. Uh, yeah. So uh, there are three questions are there. Uh, let me address those co three questions first and then conclude my views. One is about, uh, you know, about the squad, US, Japan, Philippines, and Australia in maintaining regional stability. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind, which is keep on coming and being asked in many forums in India, as well as elsewhere, is that uh, the arrival of the Quad, uh, sorry, the arrival of the squad, the US, Japan, Philippines, and Australia, to what extent it has diminished the significance of the Quad, which is about US, Japan, India, and Australia. Now, my answer to this is that what we need to understand that the arrival of these minilateral groupings, they are coming out of certain strategic needs. And when we talk about the squad, the formation of Philippines coming into this kind of a formulations, it is very much a localized issue they want to address. And the localized issue for Philippines is basically about the South China Sea issue. And there, quad has got a much more regional agenda. Uh, when we talk about US, Japan, Australia, and India, they have got much more a maritime security oriented regional agenda to address about the soft security issues. Whereas when we are talking about the squad involving Philippines, which excludes India, it is looking at much more localized issues in the South China Sea issues where Philippines is a party. So we cannot really say that the arrival of the squad has diminished the significance of the quad. In fact, the arrival of the squad is only empowering or complementing the significance of the quad process because both of these minilateral groupings are looking at the maritime issues in different ways. So I think one is a much more localized and one is a much more regionalized um, uh, minilateral groupings here. So therefore, I think um, when it comes to the squad, squad is looking at regional stability more from the localized South China Sea point of view. Whereas Quad is looking at much more regionalized um, maritime security oriented issues. But when it comes to, you know, there is a follow up comment also about the Trump administration. We don't know. We don't know. And I think uh, this is what I, we were talking about, uh, you know, just day before yesterday and yesterday with the Americans. Uh, they all are also confused. If Trump is coming back to power, to what extent there will be a change in, in US foreign policy approach and particularly when it comes to the approach towards the Indo-Pacific partners. But one thing is guaranteed, no matter whether Tom wins or does not win, I think there is a classical connotation to American uh, foreign policy issues when it comes to the Asia or to the Indo-Pacific regions. The classical connotation in American foreign policy does not uh, change because there are classical institutions who backs the foreign policy issues in uh, American foreign policy, for example, PACCOM. PACCOM has got its own mandate. 
it's not going to just change because trump has come come to power um there are you know uh, for example uh, you know uh, pentagon pentagon has got its long term objectives to, on on china con containment that's never going to change yes what trump might do is that he might bring some ad hoc approach to some of the um, you know functional issues um in the indo pacific issues there we might have a significant change in the us foreign policy or a minor change but it depends on the issues that trump is going to talk about so trump coming to power is not really going to see a huge change in us foreign policy there might be a, some factual or subject oriented changes but that is also conditional in nature then there is a follow up question is is minilaterals and informal intergovernmental organizations are same or synonymous no they are not the same they are not synonymous in nature minilateral groupings uh, could be strategic they could be conditional they could be temporary uh, in informal intergovernmental organi uh, organizations are somewhat um, continuous in nature they could be long term and they could be permanent um, for example uh, let me give an example of informal intergovernmental organization i'm sure you must have heard about the intergovernmental organization which is both informal and formal is called idea intergovernmental um, democratic alliance uh, idea idea international it's a intergovernmental organizations um, uh, it does not have necessarily a fixed secretary but it has its intergovernmental organizational chapter so i think it is not the same minilateral groupings are much more ad hoc oriented they are trilateral they are quadrilateral they could be more than four countries whereas informal inter intergovernmental organizations are much bigger it could have more than 10 members or 20 members and they they continue to exist on a long term um there is one follow up last question i will take is that i think um, there is a question that can you give some examples of minilateral organizations of middle powers yes first we need to understand that minilateral group organizations are not necessarily organizations minilaterals are probably groupings they are not necessarily organizations so here what we are talking about minilateral groupings and there are minilateral groupings which are coming up in the form of trilateral and quadrilaterals uh, of course in quadrilaterals we have not seen much but mostly in the form of trilaterals for example india australia indonesia india france australia so there are minilaterals are emerging and also there are classical institutions um, or organizations who are minilateral organizations involves rising powers and middle powers for example let's take the example of bimstek bimstek exam you know gives a classic example that india is a kind of a um, middle power or a rising powers but other powers are not so but those powers are rising for example the case of other countries in the bay of bengal regions they are they are also continuously rising so what we are talking about here is a much more ad hoc groupings uh, on the one hand minilateral could be ad hoc groupings but on the other hand there could be also established uh, organizations which are there which involves middle powers uh, but also it involves some other powers i'll stop here thank you thank you uh, dr panda uh, dr pramesha uh, in closing remarks um, i would say this only that um, you know this uh, debate which has been always um, which actually started um, exactly with the initiation of i'll use i'll borrow from what uh, professor koga said strategic uh, minilaterals i think that um, the purpose or not the purpose obviously not the purpose is it in a way showing that multilateral organizations are losing their importance um as i said uh, both have to be looked at through very separate lens um because minilaterals have one specific purpose not necessarily one but they all um, have shared purposes but again um we do not know how long they would sustain uh because if the issues and purposes are met uh what more issues they will take on or how long will they sustain but multilateral organizations um will sustain um for uh you know years and that is important because you need a platform where more number of countries come together discuss their own issues uh also get to know what issues are impacting other regions even if they are far off regions from their own 
from their own geographies. That is also important uh, to keep uh, um, to keep in track, to keep track of the developments elsewhere. And I think um, another thing is that um, the fact that these minilaterals are also giving countries um, the voices or the conferences to keep to show that I think it's a lot to do also with the fact that many countries who were previously averse to joining minilateral groupings like Indonesia, for example, who is now a part of a grouping like the India, Australia, Indonesia, though we have had two foreign ministers level meetings. But again, how much will this trilateral sustain is sometimes a question which uh, is asked uh, very frequently. So, but I think the fact that these aver uh, these countries which are averse have also come to uh, accept the concept of minilateralism is also to do with the fact that being a part of these minilateral, uh, minilateral groupings also gives you uh, the leverage that you're a part of the discussion in the Indo-Pacific. I think you're a part of the emerging dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. You're a part of the uh, you know global discussions around the Indo-Pacific. I think that is also very important. Um, but at the same time, uh, these countries are very clear as to what their objectives are. I think for a country like Indonesia, even if a part of this trilateral, it ensures that it is still uh, basically the convening country in the ASEAN. It is still the, considered the first among equals within the ASEAN. So I think this, these kind of um, even being a part of the trilateral, even uh, you know they have still uh, tried to even if their previous foreign ministers have spoken of Indo-Pacific strategies, but they still try to push the way for an ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So I think. At the same time, these countries also made their commitments towards their own regional organizations. I think that is also important to um, consider that uh, even if we are cooperating to these multilaterals, multilateral organizations and cooperating to these countries bilaterally as well as multilaterally to these organizations are also important. So um, in those ways, I think uh, multilateral organizations are important, especially I'm uh, keeping my focus on Southeast Asia here, but especially for a region like Southeast Asia. I think it is extremely important. Um, to you know, keep ASEAN showing up in the meet of the reasons why U.S. is um, you know there is this trust deficit um, for the U.S. because the U.S. heads of states have missed a lot of ASEAN meetings. But I think in ASEAN showing up is also very important. So uh, at least being a part of discussions in the ASEAN and ASEAN-led mechanisms is also very important. So um, multilateral organizations, especially organizations like the ASEAN, is very important no matter how many minilateral, or minilateral frameworks or groupings uh, flourish in the Indo-Pacific. Point uh, well uh, taken, uh, Dr. Pramisha. Um, over to Professor Koga. Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, so for the uh, uh, likelihood of the uh, future of the uh, uh, minilateralism, I, I think the uh, uh, it will continue uh, as long as we are actually seeing the shift uh, in the uh, uh, the the uh, balance of power or a power shift uh, in the uh, East Asia in the Pacific and beyond. So I guess the uh, because the multilateral uh, the uh, frameworks are very useful and flexible. So that like, they're gonna actually at least like, commit to create and nurture uh, some of the multilateral frameworks uh, in the future. As we could actually see uh, from the uh, speeches made by the uh, Jake Sullivan repeatedly. Uh, National Security Advisor from the United States. Uh, he was kind of emphasizing the importance of the lattice work of the uh, cooperation. And that's actually the uh, kind of idea uh, because the, uh, it is the uh, on the exit on the uh, the uh, building on the uh, existing the uh, regional or the uh, secu uh, the framework, cooperative framework, they are actually trying to kind of supplement or like creating the more kind of uh, the uh, uh, the issue based the uh, frameworks and so on and so forth. And then the I think like this is a really uh, important yeah, indication uh, that like they are willing to. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Is it okay? So yeah, so in in that sense, the uh, I I think this is a really important kind of uh, remarks. The question is the uh, to what extent uh, the United States really uh, try to uh, the uh, clarify the institutional uh, division of labor between the uh, those kind of military frameworks and the ASEAN. As the uh, uh, Premier said, the uh, I agree that the, uh, the those kind of militarists always emphasize the importance of the uh, ASEAN centrality and the ASEAN unity, and that's great. But then sometimes, like I'm not really sure what that actually means. 
because they don't actually specify uh, what, what they are they are trying to do and what do they actually really, what they expect from the ASEAN as well. So I think like this kind of like the discussion needs to be uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, continued and uh, uh, also the uh, important uh, to identify the uh, those kind of institutional division of labor uh, between the ASEAN and the multilaterals. Um, on the, uh, the uh, la uh, lastly, the, uh, just one quick the uh, comments uh, that because the uh, I, I think like I got the uh, the question with regard to the uh, multilaterals and then also the uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, particularly the uh, uh, the uh, South China Sea issues. Um, uh, I think the uh, Southeast Asian countries are uh, yes, uh, they are trying to create some of the multilaterals if they are not. Uh, seeing any kind of the uh, uh, the solution or the means to resolve the uh, uh, the uh, most kind of immediate issues for them. So, for example, the Philippines, uh, the ASEAN has been talking about the code of conduct, and then if the ASEAN could sustain the status quo, maybe they would. But then the uh, uh, that was not possible. So. Uh, even though like the uh, the Philippines still uh, focuses on the uh, dialogue uh, and the importance of the ASEAN, uh, but the uh, they need to actually do something. And then in that sense, they uh, they wanted to create more kind of uh, stronger strategic ties with the Japan and then also the United States. So with that, the uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. I think uh, all the questions have also been answered. Are there any more questions that we uh, can take? All of them are answered. Uh, Sarabjit sir, uh, would you uh, like to make uh, any comment? Is he there? I, I'm, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And I think yes, I have sir. nothing to add. It's been covered, so uh, maybe next time. But uh, thank you for your views totally. And I'm a big fan of minilaterals, but they have their severe limitations. If one nation falls out or two nations have a falling out, then the progress gets limited. I mean, the one example is your India, Australia, France trilateral that has got frozen due to AUKUS. And uh, I just hope that the Colombo security conclave continues functioning despite India Maldives difference in opinion. So there are limitations, but uh, by and large, minilaterals and trilaterals do work. That's yes, just in fact, what one right is there. also uh, an example, you know how in 2008, what could not really uh, come up. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, you know, one nation or two countries not being on the same page may impact, uh, you know, proper functioning. Of the one is I2U2 is yet to get off the ground, but perhaps it will be put in hibernation for some time. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think I'll... Uh, There's I'll, another I'll... question for Dr. Then, Sorry, there is a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Any questions? Kumar, Ella. Uh, uh, can Anna? I read it out? Yeah, please do. Um, as you mentioned, there are many minilateral uh, forums in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. So, do you think having too many uh, frameworks serving different interests can lead to fragmentation? Uh, also, I would like to have your suggestions for new researchers interested in Indo-Pacific studies. So you are on mute. Well, uh, first about the fragmented, uh, um, you know, interest. Um, I don't think so. I think uh, uh, as we move forward, we'll be seeing more minilateral groupings coming up in the process because this is what many powers, many countries are looking, different associations and trying to achieve different objectives. So I think moving forward, we'll see many more minilateral groupings coming up. In fact, what we have not really yet seen is that military groupings, uh, much military groupings coming up with um, lower end economics or uh, lower ranked economics in the regions. Uh, you know, countries like Sri Lanka, countries like Maldives, but moving forward, they could be also encouraged to form military groupings with big actors. So this is what we are going to see. So I don't think it is more about uh, fragmented interest. It is about shared interest in different, uh, you know, subregions of uh, Indo-Pacific regions. Uh, answering your second question, that uh, about uh, 
what you would suggest what i would suggest about uh, indo pacific as a study discipline don't study indo pacific study a particular country uh, gain specialization what a study a particular dimension either economics or foreign policy or security and then you move after few years 5 10 years move to indo pacific but don't see and take indo pacific as a subject you will be left no way i think it is important to have a area study specialization first and this is where i have written uh, that you know if you see about indo pacific this is my argument um complementing what rory metcalf in uh, anu has argued that it is a special concept uh, indo pacific is a um, uh, you know reactive framework based on realism so you are only studying partially if you are uh, trying to you know understand indo pacific there is an alternative world that is the eurasian politics you need to understand so it is important to understand a country uh, you know gain your expertise on a particular country um, pick up language and uh, you know try to um, uh, improve your domain expertise on a particular country or a particular theme of the regions and then you gradually pan out over the next 10 years or so to study more about indo pacific thank you there's another question um, do minilaterals contribute to sub regional and regional cooperation or not yes they do they do contribute i would say in fact uh, this is how if we see i mean let's take the example uh, uh, you know uh, beyond the indonesia uh, indo pacific indo pacific uh, we have we have been discussing a lot about indo pacific let's take the example from the other side from the eurasian side um if you see the formation of uh, you know brics uh, formation of aiib how was that really possible it was possible because there is a trilateral foreign minister level dialogue existed between india china and russia and these three critical these three countries played critical role in terms of not only forming brics not only in terms of forming new development bank but also forming aiib um you know it is one thing to say that aiib is a creation of china true china has created and china is the leading actor but india and russia are also the critical you know voting rights holder in the aiib so there are examples where small militaries they complement the bigger forums and the bigger institutions thank you thank you dr panda with that i would now invite dr shelly johnny from cppr to uh, deliver the vote of thanks hello uh, am i audible yes yeah uh thank you very much uh, first uh, i would like to thank our speakers uh, dr jagannath panda dr pramesha saha uh professor k koga along with our moderator dr shreya upadhyay for uh, contributing their views on a very uh, uh developing uh, topic which is which is still uh, developing and there are lots of interesting aspects that have still yet to be uh, discussed so this is uh, i believe that there should be more such webinars and conferences uh, looking at the various aspects of minilateralism in the indo pacific and uh, especially when i uh, 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 just try to mention what uh, dr Jag jagannath panda had mentioned just right now about how to approach uh, an area like uh, indo pacific uh, studies i think it's very relevant and so we need more such uh, discussions which can throw up more ideas and greater and create uh, greater understanding uh, on this topic i would like to thank uh, Ms. Amba Vatal of uh, IPC for bringing forward this idea in the first place and uh, taking the effort to uh, uh, bring it into light and, and all her efforts that she has taken to organize this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, I would like to thank uh, uh, Ms. April Susanna Varki uh, and Ms. Neelima A of CPPR for uh, uh, for coordinating uh, 
uh, the, the efforts for this webinar from the side of CPPR. I would like to thank all the, the audience for raising the questions and increasing a very, I mean, uh, creating a very uh, interesting uh, uh, webinar. And I hope more such uh, efforts will be taken uh, in order to further our understanding of the Indo Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.